and this is our leadership seminar series for the month of April. Um, I understand it's crit week for architects and that there are also a lot of projects and, and final exams so that might have something to do with why we have a small group. I'm going to introduce you to Emily Firstel and then Emily will tell you who else is here to speak with us today. Emily is the Regional Coordinator for Student Engagement and Volunteer Engagement with the United Way out of Detroit. Emily, welcome. Hi. How's everyone? Good. Um, well, like Jennifer mentioned, I'm, I'm Emily and I work at United Way for Southeastern Michigan. Um, nonprofit, we're downtown. Has anyone ever heard of United Way before? Right, is everyone familiar with uh, United Way's work? Did you mention um, the area where we focus? Well, we have programs in, our focus area is in education, financial stability, and basic needs. So we work in high school turnaround, uh, working in our, our network of excellent schools uh, throughout the southeastern Michigan region, looking to turn around uh, high schools whose graduation levels are less than 60% and get that up to 80% um, by the year 2018. And we have a, a set of best practices and programs that we work in high schools to do. Um, we also are looking at the front end of um, the education system, which is zero to five, early learning, um, early childhood initiatives. We have early, early learning communities training parents and caregivers. Um, the best way to uh, interact with their children and get them ready to learn is that they're entering school um, and entering kindergarten ready to learn and have met uh, development benchmarks um, in literacy to uh, be ready to learn and um, so that they have all the resources they need to be successful in school. Our financial stability work um, is to use the, the philosophy of earn it, keep it, grow it, and it's helping families who are working to uh, manage their budgets, uh, develop relationships with banks so that they're not losing money um, to cashing checks uh, every week at uh, check advance institutions. So um, just working with families with, around programs to help them earn the money, keep it, and grow it through savings programs. And our basic needs initiatives are, um, we have 211, which is a resource um, resource hotline, and you can dial 211 and get connected to food, clothing, um, health care, uh, pretty much anything you could uh, think of. You can dial 211 and they have referral services to a whole database of uh, nonprofit agencies in the region um, to help people get connected to the resources they need. Um, so, all of these programs uh, lead into our mission, which is to make uh, Detroit and Greater Detroit um, a successful place to live and work for every individual. So our, our goal in all of the work that we do is to make uh, Greater Detroit um, the top, one of the top five places to live and work by the year 2030. That seems really audacious, um, and but there are a lot of people out there who have um, really uh, connected with us as individuals and feel that this mission is something worth uh, working towards. Um, so that leads me to uh, Joe Gaglio is one of such individuals. Um, he had, I, I'm going to introduce also our other staff here, Brittany and Alex. Brittany is a Corporate Relations Director and Alex is an um, Associate for Volunteer Engagement working with corporate groups. Um, so I've given a bit of an overview of uh, United Way and the work that we do. Um, and so I'll just turn it over to Brittany because uh, Brittany uh, introduced Joe to me a few months ago, so she can introduce Joe. Brittany. <laughs> Surprise. Um, well, some of the companies I work with are professional service type companies, and one of those is Deloitte. Deloitte's been a great partner with United Way. They've partnered with us not just as a great financial backer of the work that we do, but also giving us access to their human capital. So they let us pull in consultants and different folks to work with us on um, skills-based volunteerism, so really putting their brains to work. If we have a problem, 
that we can't tackle as an organization, we'll bring in folks to help us with different things. And one of those people who's been very instrumental in helping us um, move our mission forward and move certain projects forward that we've otherwise kind of hit a wall on is Joe. Joe actually, last year we brought him in, um, just one of the things that he did was to help us apply for the Social Innovation Fund, which is through um, the Obama administration. At least basically to give us about $14 million to leverage here locally in the area of early childhood. We had applied for it a number of times before, kept getting denied. Um, Joe came in and worked with our staff, and two months later, suddenly we had $14 million for early childhood work. So with that, I'll turn over to Joe, and we'll talk a little bit about what that experience has been like for him. Thanks. You still didn't give me my cut of that $14 million yet, though. No, I'm kidding. Um, so listen, I, I really appreciate you being here. Uh, this topic of the idea that community involvement and leadership can intersect is something I'm, I'm kind of passionate about and I like to talk about it. The trouble is when I talk about it with my 16-month-old daughter, Elisa, she just doesn't get words like social entrepreneurialism. It doesn't connect, so I really am glad you're here. Um, I want to take you back with a little bit of a story about kind of how I got on this walk around volunteering. So let's reflect back to like 2008, late 2008. And so what was going on, and by the way, this is going to be a talk with and not a talk at. I don't, I don't want to do speeches on a, on, a, on a format that's this small. So if you don't interact, this is really going to be a long outing. So anyways, 2008, what was going on in the world and specifically in Detroit in 2008? The economy was bottoming out. Yeah. So say more about that. How bad was it? Right on. So huge issues with our local and national economy. We're in the midst of a credit crisis. It's kind of the backbone of our local economy. The automotives were teetering, perhaps on the brink of collapse at some point. It was a pretty big deal and some pretty tough times. And so um, in my first act of leadership, I, I mobilized really quickly to get a couple of my buddies to come to the pub with me so we could complain about all the things that were going wrong in the city. That's not really the message I want to deliver, but really that's what happened. So we got together um, just experiencing the reality of what was going on and we just had a couple pints and talked about how bad it was. Ironically though, in that experience, a really amazing thing happened that was pretty transformational. Um, but I'm gonna stop on that for a second because I wanna actually know more about you before I get back to that story. So, all students at Lawrence Tech, right? Majors? Graphic design? Okay. Okay. Okay, Travis? Okay, so kind of a, a nice diversity. How many of you have actually done volunteerism, traditional volunteerism, using your hands to physically lift the community in some way? You have? Have you ever done, you have as well? Have you ever done skills-based volunteerism where you're using your mind at a not-for-profit in some unique way? So, so here's the topic that I really want to explore today. It's the idea, that, so all volunteerism is great. It's really good. So whether you're mobilizing people to get food distributed to homeless folks, to volunteer uh, perhaps in a classroom or prepare things for readiness of school, to clean up a playground, all that stuff is great. But the walk that I'm on is that I really believe that I can move a not-for-profit or the community further by using my mind instead of my hands. And so it's all about trying to um, do that for myself but also create on-ramps for others to do that as well. So that's kind of the, the journey that I want to explore. I think that what you'll find is if you do that yourself, there's a strong correlation between your learning as a human being and getting involved in those kinds of experiences. And so hopefully this story when we return to the pub will highlight some of that. But that's kind of where we're gonna to go today. So back to the pub, right? Me sitting in the pub with my couple of buddies. And these guys aren't just any, any buddies. It was Chris Yule, who at the time was a middle market banker with Comerica. So he's dealing with clients that are about 100 million to a billion, smart dude. My other buddy, Ben Smith, who's with uh, Plant Moran's real estate group. And so he's a real estate investment kind of guy, structures real estate for large companies. And the two of us, or the three of us were sitting there, and we were all sharing something in common. And that thing that we had in common was really, it was fear. So at that point, my two oldest children, so Antonio is six now and Dominic is four, and again, I have a daughter that's 16 months. But at that point, my son Antonio was three and my other son was one. So I got small children. Chris had a little girl that was about one and Ben Smith had one on the way. So the three of us are sitting there in the midst of this challenge of our economy. And here's the question we were asking. Am I gonna disadvantage my kids by having them grow up in Southeast Michigan? That was the question for us. 
And it was pivotal, right? That was the big deal. We didn't know the answer to it, but here's what we decided. We just said that we would either do one of two things. We would get involved and find out whether or not there's hope for this region, or within three years we would leave it. So that's the choice we made that night. That was the pivotal thing we decided. And we never really realized how transformational that would be to us, but the arc that that had on our lives was really impactful. So here's what we did. We, again, we were in the midst of complaining and we decided to then mobilize in some way. And there was a lot of foundational issues in our region at that time, right? You could pick any of them. You could pick health, you could pick hunger. But we settled on two things that we thought were really, really important and our passion seemed to circulate around. We thought about entrepreneurial ecosystem. In other words, hey, the automotives, if they fail, what are we gonna do? Where are the entrepreneurs? Where are the startup businesses? Where's the diversification in the economy gonna come from? It has to come from the entrepreneurial sector. So we said, let's focus on that and figure out what's going on. We didn't know whether or not we could help there, but we wanted to know what was happening. The other area we focused on was education. Foundational to any vibrant city center is the idea that there's a good educational system. If, if, if the kids can't get through school, their ability to participate in a knowledge economy is nearly non-existent. So we said, okay, we gotta focus on those two things. And what we decided to do was understand who's doing what in those given areas. We had already been working with United Way in limited capacities to understand their work, and we were finding it really interesting. But we were kind of, you know, we were kind of on the periphery of it. We didn't really know what they were doing. We weren't deep enough in it to get it, but we thought it was pretty cool. We just decided that let's go deeper and really understand what the strategy is at the United Way around education. Similarly, we did the same for the entrepreneurial ecosystem. I'm gonna start with the entrepreneurial side because I think it's a really interesting, um, interesting walk and then I'll get back to education. So with entrepreneurialism, um, we really had no idea who was doing what in the region. We just flexed our business cards and the fact that we were coming in to just ask questions and understand what people were doing. And the fascinating leadership lesson is that most people are really, really apt to tell you what they do, right? If they enjoy it, they'll sit down and talk about it. So we just went out to the, um, the incubators in town, the venture capitalists, uh, the folks that were you know, driving regional change through entrepreneurialism, the MEDC, and some other organizations, and we just sat down with people and said, hey, what's going on in our region and how do we make this a more vibrant place for entrepreneurs to succeed? It was amazing to us that we had 40 meetings that year with different people and different organizations. Um, and we learned a lot about what was happening and what wasn't happening. We started to form some ideas, but we really tracked on um, the idea that really great businesses have um, the ability to do economic gain, be sustainable, so they lift the environment, and also lift community. And so we had already been, again, participating in some community-oriented things with United Way. So again, those three concepts for us really resonated. There really wasn't anybody in our region doing anything around those three things simultaneously except one guy. The guy's name is Tom Brennan. And he was, at that point, refurbishing an old building in downtown Detroit. It's called the Green Garage. Anybody heard of it? Yeah, do you know much about it? Or you just kind of heard it out there? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So I'm gonna, if I may recap, they took this old building, a Model T factory, you know, 1920s, 30s architecture, and, and what Tom was told was his vision was, let's make this a very green building. Let's really reduce the energy consumption footprint and make this thing a really vibrant place. And by the way, I want to do that for what it would cost me to tear it down and build something new. And everybody said, ah, that really, Tom, that can't be done. It's not possible. But Tom, what he did was pretty fascinating. He just compiled a group of people, volunteers, and got cognitive diversity in the room, a bunch of different disciplines, and they figured it out. And if you go to that building today, it's made with all, generally all recycled materials or sustainable materials. Its energy footprint in a huge cavernous place was estimated at $300 annually to keep this building alive and running and heated and cooled. 300 bucks a year, that's, that's pretty small, right? So he turned what couldn't be done into a reality. After that, he said, look, I've got all of this knowledge now amongst my group, my community around sustainability. How do I give it away to the community in a meaningful way? And at the same time, he said, well, look, we, we've got to do this in a way that also allows people to have entrepreneurial practices that are triple bottom line. So he wanted to create an incubator. And so Chris and Ben and I decided to help Tom to get his incubator off the ground and running. 
And by incubator, it was really more of a design center for entrepreneurs. So typical incubator practices is one entrepreneur comes in the door, they take a bunch of classes with the output being a business plan. Tom flipped all that. He said, look, that's not how it works. That's not the best way. Why don't we get one entrepreneur with a group of people from the community to get the best thinking in the room to design the business, not a piece of paper? We th said, that, that makes sense. That's natural. That, 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 that really um, is consistent with the way natural things happen in the world. And so that's what we did. And we took a couple entrepreneurs through this process of um, facilitated workshops where everybody could participate and put the best thinking forward. And the entrepreneurs really just moved their business from wherever they were to sort of one stage larger or more formalized. And in that we learned that entrepreneurs make lots of different um, front end mistakes. And this process allows them to not make those mistakes which are really costly. Let me give you an example of that. So let's assume that I want to start a transportation company. I want to start a limousine company. What might be one of the first things I'm going to need to start my business? Limo company. Limo. So most entrepreneurs would go out and they would buy a limo, right? Because you're going to do a limousine company. What's the problem with that? No chauffeur, nobody to drive it. What else? No advertising. Exactly. So you don't have a brand. You just have a car. By the way, you're paying for that, but you have no income coming in. And that's a kind of a really simple example, but that's the same mistakes entrepreneurs make over and over and over again. But to have them come in in a session where they can think about the design of the business before they put a dollar forward is a really healthy thing to do. So again, we tracked on the green garage because we thought that made a heck of a lot of sense. And so that is up and running. It's a design center where folks in the community can come in, develop their business, and be successful as entrepreneurs doing triple bottom line businesses. So it's one of a kind kind of thing and it's really interesting and it's really been an honor to be part of its formation and then um, to help entrepreneurs on a, on a sort of one-on-one -on -one basis. So what did I get from that? I, I guess a lot of things. I actually ask the question all the time now, whether I'm at work or solving any problem, the question I ask is, is that natural? Does that make sense? Is that how people behave? Is that consistent with the way nature would behave on that? So anytime you're creating something that feels mechanical, it's probably not going to work that very long because people don't work that well in mechanical environments. And so working with Tom, I learned that, and that's the question I ask all the time whenever we're creating a new idea or a new process or a new rollout. Do you have the right passion alignment of people to what you're asking them to do? So that was a huge takeaway from that experience. So shifting gears back to education, right? So there's two tenets, entrepreneurialism, education. On the education side, which is probably where I spend more of my time as a volunteer, the United Way was doing some really cool stuff. They had taken a huge high school, and as Emily kind of described, they shattered it up from one big mega footprint down to four smaller schools. So they could align it more on an industry slant with sort of like a health focus, a leadership focus, a creative focus. And to me, that just makes sense. The kids just don't get lost when they're in a smaller setting, right? Um, I can find you very easily in this room. It would be really hard to find you personally in a room that had 1,000 people in it. Simple, right? So that kind of strategy, again, drawing on the Green Garage experience, just made sense to us. And so we wanted to support it and lift it in some meaningful way. And so that's really where we tried to mobilize our friends in the community who were, again, part of corporations or in the creative sector to see what does the United Way need to support their vision around lifting education. And we didn't know the answer to that. And I don't think the United Way knew that answer either. But what we did was this mutual learning process of realizing we both had something important to give to the cause. And there was receptivity to continued and mutual learning about how to make that work. And so a few things came out of that. Um, one was just a commitment that we have to work on this together, that education is critical. I learned some interesting statistics that I love to share. And Brittany can correct me if I get these wrong. But this is, so this is where my mind tracks when I think about education. So in a high poverty, low literacy home, did you know that children will hear by age three, three million fewer words? Is that right, Brittany? So roughly three million fewer words for a child by age three in a high poverty, low literacy home than what you might have experienced in your home if it was more of a sort of middle class and upsetting. That's a huge difference, right? The children can't really recover from that. Another staggering statistic that just blows me away. Do you know how they project prison populations? Any ideas? 
It's based on fourth grade reading scores. There's a correlation between education and what the sort of outcome is from a behavior and socioeconomic perspective. We found that pretty compelling, and there's lots of other things that compel you to that work. Um, and so we wanted to motivate and lift it. So one of the things we did was we got into the inner city high schools at Cody High um, with a bunch of people from the corporate world, and we figured we were just going to come in and we would just save the world. We realized how wrong that really was. So we sat down with um, a bunch of principals. We had people from Deloitte and Comerica and Ford um, ready to sort of bring not only themselves but their organizations behind them to do something powerful for this Cody High School. And here's what we got. We were like, what do you need? Well, we'd love pencils. It, and paper would be good. Um, they didn't know what to ask for. They didn't know what we were actually offering and what we would actually commit to and deliver. It's not their fault, but lots of people come in with thoughts that I'm going to really help that don't deliver. And so we actually needed to build some trust. So that's what we did. Chris Ewell and Andy Dunsky from the team that we had went in and actually spent time in Cody High School for about a year. They went there once a week to observe, to watch, to build trust with the administrators, with the teachers, even with the students, and actually learn what do they really need. And here's what they got. So remember, we started with pe papers, pencils, pens, and we evolved to something better, which was, you know, guys, what would really be helpful would be to get the kids in the inner city to understand what jobs look like that are outside of the inner city, right? So they're exposed to their neighborhood geography. Can you get them outside of that? Can you have them see what a job inside of Deloitte and Touche or Comerica looks like? Can you bring in people that can talk to them in a meaningful way about other opportunities and why education is important? So with the help of Brittany and, and the team, we organized some career days. We did um, five of them in total. And we had about 60 or 70 folks from the community come into the inner city schools and talk to the students about the jobs they do, why education mattered, and why that's important stuff. So that's a great example of, again, skills-based volunteerism to bring that into the communities. Um, these days, and I think because we have earned a little bit of trust with the United Way of understanding the strategy and what they're trying to achieve, um, Chris and Ben and I, and along with a few others, are involved in some really cool stuff. We're actually involved in some of the strategy around shaping how the United Way attacks problems in the community. So uh, we've sat on the Social Innovation Fund board. So yes, yeah, certainly we helped them maybe win the grant, and I had a tiny role in that. It's really the great people, you know, the way that get that stuff done and done right. But once you get the grant and got the money, you got to find a way to figure out who you give it to. And so we had the honor of participating in the Social Innovation Fund Advisory Board to look at the applications of who wanted the money, what they were going to do with it, and does that make sense. Fundamentally, what we're trying to shape is sort of a holistic strategy around education using the money from the Social Innovation Fund to support it. And so we looked at a lot of proposals. What we're looking for was collaboration, um, a really great vision, really great idea, sense of collaboration amongst partners. And those are the folks we awarded that, that, fun, that funding to. And so it was really cool to participate in that. Again, that's skills-based volunteerism. In order to sit at that table, you have to understand the broader strategy of the United Way and something about education in general. So you have to earn your place there. And, and I think by doing a lot of the stuff in the schools, we have ultimately earned our place to be able to participate in that, which was, which was really cool. Um, these days, Brittany and I track a lot on the idea of how do you get others involved to do kind of what we're doing around all these other strategies in the United Way. Um, and what we've found is that it's really about understanding how do you get people involved on the front end of defining a project. Right, Alex? And if you can get involved on in the front end of defining a project, it's much more likely that you can find a place for different unique skills in the community to come in and be involved in it. And so we spend a lot of time figuring out how to do that. So here's the challenge for you. If you've got a cause that you're interested in, and you're working on volunteering in some way, figure out how do you take the skills you've earned here at Lawrence Tech and just in life in general and apply them in some meaningful way to that not-for-profit. Here's a couple great examples, right? You do graphic design. How good is the marketing coming out of a not-for-profit? What's their funding and budget look like for that? That's not where their money is going, right? Their money is going to the work. So could you use your skills to take the marketing, the design, the communications, the strategy around what the stuff looks like, both electronic and print, and make it better? I bet you they'd love to have you involved in that. You'd learn a lot in the process about what they do and how you can support it. So anytime you're solving a complex problem like that, and I would just say that, hey, what does our new vision for our communications look like is not an easy task. It's a huge deal. Right? So you'll learn a lot in that process. Um, engineering, 
engineering brings a lot to the table, even if you don't think that the organizations would typically be receptive to that. Here's a couple things that engineers do really, really well. The concept of project management and putting things out in sequence, in linear thought, in logic, structuring something, breaking it down into smaller pieces, that thinking is essential to not-for-profits. Any strategy has to come down into subcomponent parts, right? Can you bring that to the table and offer it to them in some meaningful way? So a couple of simple ideas um, around that. So I'm going to stop here and see if we have some questions or maybe get some dialogue going. Anything resonate out of that that kind of thinks, you know, you might take some next steps on? One thing I wanted to uh, point out, John, as you were talking, is that um, <coughs> you guys are all students and looking towards your future, and you've been told that volunteering will help, you know, shows that you, you have leadership, et cetera. But what, what you're talking about is really, as opposed to using your hands, is really like developing your professional network and your professional skills uh, through this type of volunteer work. I think that that's a distinct advantage. I know as an employer, I would be very impressed to see that, you know, if, uh, if an engineer had come in and taken a project cradle to grade with the United States or something like that. Yeah, so I do a lot of hiring at Deloitte, right? I get them in a position now where I'm able to hire people. And hiring practices are about the same in all the organizations. You're going to sit down and you're going to have an interview with somebody. And all the resumes, no matter how hard you try, they all look about the same for students, except for a few that have meaningful experiences to talk about. You can get those meaningful experiences in a couple ways. You can work, you can volunteer, you can be in charge of social um, organizations at the college. And that's about it. There's a couple buckets there. And everybody's going to have stuff in those buckets. The key is, if you really want the best job, you got to have the best stuff to talk about. you got to be able to relate your experiences in a way that's really attractive to an employer. To say that you translated your skills in engineering to solving some problem in a very different discipline tells me that you are a problem solver and a thinker. It's pretty hard to say the same thing if you don't have similar experiences. So what I see is the type of students that get jobs at Deloitte, which is an organization, you, again, Here's kind of the stats at Deloitte. It's about 3.5 or better. People that are leaders, have student organizations, volunteer a lot, um, do internships in, in impressive firms. But when we talk to them, it's really about distilling it to what experiences have you actually had. And those that have done stuff like volunteering, they just stick out a lot differently than students that have. So the broader range of experiences will position you for likely a better job when you kind of come out of this, out of this thing. There's definitely a correlation. So when I was in college, I had a passion for education, mm -hmm. but I didn't know where to go. Like, I knew what my interest was, and I knew I wanted to be involved, but where do you go once you identify that? I think um, you're volunteering to give out your number to these students, right? <laughs> No, I think, it, I think it comes down to narrowing down what the cause was, right? So that story about the pints at the bar, you know, it sounds kind of anecdotal, but really what it did is it forced us to narrow in on a cause. So I think the, the most important thing to do is figure out what it is that you're potentially passionate about. Because as, as much as it's um, an ancillary benefit of all this stuff to have a big network, the driver for it is that you have to be authentic in the volunteerism. If you're not authentic, the organizations and the people can sense it pretty quickly. And they don't have time for disingenuous people who are looking to build resume bullets. They don't want that. They'll sniff it out and you'll be done immediately. So once you find a cause that you can be passionate about and actually commit to, the next thing to do is to start to talk to folks at the organization. Probably the right front door oftentimes is a volunteer coordination office to get in and do any kind of volunteering. Then once you're there, try to meet people that are driving the strategy of the work and ask and think about, maybe not ask them how you can help, but maybe tell them how you can help. I think having an idea of where you can fit in will prompt more ideas on their side to get you matched up. Actually, Brittany, you know, you've done this a lot. Lots of people come to your organization and want to help. What are some of the things that you've seen that have worked really well? I think just when people initially come to us, a lot of times we might lead them and try and point them to the right opportunities. And then once they're in it and they can see it, they usually see the opportunities for themselves. I'm no longer leading them. It's more of, I mean, even when you first got involved, it's kind of like, we well, got to come up with this, this, and this. And after a while, it's like more of my going to Joe and asking what you were working on because 
but what's the high point that I would think of him, but with him finding them on your own and pulling together his own resources. Not being necessarily financially, but you know, he would see a problem and he knew somebody. Um, one of the examples is Ben Smith, who works at Plant Brand. One of our schools was threatened to be closed, it's one of the tri public schools. And they were having an issue at the school that they couldn't really figure out how they put together a plan to justify the school staying open. And uh, our VP actually called Joe, and uh, Joe put him in touch with Ben, and Ben recruited his network of professionals that uh, do that sort of thing on a regular basis, and they pulled together a plan pretty quickly in the school so today. It's, uh, you know, it's just kind of interesting. It's, it's actually not that hard. Although it's hard, but not that hard. Because like, once you get in and learn, the opportunities are really natural to find. Um, and so I think that's really all you gotta do is take any action forward results in probably more opportunities for you. And our first step was just trying to figure out what was going on. Everything else after that happened in a really natural way. No way, when I was sitting at the pub complaining and deciding to finally do something about it, could I ever predict that it would you know, result in all of the stuff that we had kind of accomplished and done and been involved with. So I think the first thing to do is just move, do anything, rather than sit idle or wait for an invitation to be involved. Those invitations probably aren't going to come. You have to actually be assertive. I mean, that's just, that's just life. Um, kind of back to this theme of, of leadership. So if I, can, if I could give you any advice in your career and in life, I think um, there's a couple correlations, right? I think in life, most people want some of the same things. You want fulfillment and feel like what you do in life makes some kind of a difference. We haven't solved the education problem. There's still a deplorable rate of dropouts in the high schools. Not all the kids in Detroit are getting to kindergarten ready to learn, but we're seeing the trend line go up. It's not because of me or my personal efforts. I have a really tiny part of that, but you know what? I have at least some part in that, and I feel good about what I do because of that. So there's the fulfillment side of that equation, right? Um, I feel some responsibility, and I'm blessed with the opportunity to actually help out, and so I do it, and that makes me feel great. The other thing, though, about that is, I think there's a side of all of us that wants to be successful in what we do. And the interesting thing is that you can have fulfillment and success simultaneously. And here's one way to do that. Whatever you do, get involved in something that's either broken or changing. And the reason is that you have to ask why. So those of us that go around and ask why rather than how, will find a lot more satisfaction and success. So when I work with large companies, so I work with large companies, banks oftentimes, they're trying to solve big problems, make big business model changes, and the people that are involved in them on my client side and with our firm, you have to ask kind of why to put stuff together rather than how. It's not about how do I execute, it's why is this happening and what do we do about it. Those are the same problems that you find on the not-for-profit side. Social change is massive and, and big, and um, you're always asking why, is it the way it is, what's the root cause, and how do you address it? So if you can put yourself in things that are changing, or difficult, or complex, you will always learn more than the person next to you who's just executing on the day-to-day -day and figuring out how do I do it, faster, cheaper, better. The big ticket items are, why are we doing it in the first place? That would be my advice from a career perspective uh, for you. And I think the correlation between community change, social change, and change at the office, it's all about generally um, asking why, understanding who's involved, who's responsible, who do we mobilize together to get something done. So that stuff, I think, is just inherent in this kind of work. So what, any questions at all? So what are your thoughts on sort of the Detroit community? When you reflect back to 08, 09, do you feel it's any different or better than it was, to, is it better today than it was back then? I'd be just interested in your sense of, of hope for our region. Um, well, I know lately, uh, back in you know, 2008, you know, the, the bailouts and stuff going around, and, um, I know that Chrysler paid off their debts early and Ford was on the same track, and, and things were starting to look back up, so. I mean, I'm kind of hoping for it. I know um, some of the other stuff, I help with cleaners a little bit, and I know that um, some of like the child hunger rates and stuff have, have gone down too. So I mean, that's just kind of my views. I think that's great. Cleaners is a great organization. Um, do you do the one in downtown Detroit? Yeah. 
yeah. Do you do some of the, the like packing of food, or do you get involved in well, a different way? I've just done some projects with them. We did um, like some research. I know part of it was for my um, part of it was for my leadership two thousand. But then we continued further, and we helped them create like info packets and stuff for some of their other things, like um, kids helping kids and uh, empty bowls, which are some of the like smaller programs that really focus just specifically on child. How did you feel about doing it? Uh, it, it? It was really good. I mean, I was really happy that they were they were pleased with what we gave them. You know, I going into it and just creating it, having no real graphical background, I kind of felt like uh, somebody else probably could do this better. But even just having them, you know. Helping them and knowing that what we made, even if it makes a little bit of a difference, gets a little more interest in it, then they feel pretty good. That, I mean, it sort of seems to have raised perhaps your own confidence level about your skills until they translate in a different place. So, I mean, it's kind of in action. You've done that already once. Um, do you think you'll do more of that? Probably, yeah. 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 So, do, do, the, do you have plans to stay in this region after you graduate, or do you have plans to depart from it? What are your thoughts? Um, this year I'm going to be uh, part of the um, University of Chinese Jewish program in Detroit and the U.S. led by the Jewish Detroit. Um, I just started a posting uh, version this year. And I'm not from this area, so I don't know how to do that. I'm from Michigan. So um, going to the seminar is going to be a lot of really kind of good perspective on that book, Detroit. And we have panelists um, in it. That's good. It sounds like it's maybe hopefully created some connectedness for you to this part of the of the state. Yeah. Do you think you participate in any of those change initiatives? Um. Yeah. The I think it was the last session I went to from um, economic development. Actually, we had uh, Jason Hall was there from that's right. Yeah, that's cool. That's good. Yeah, it's always interesting, right? So I work with a lot of talent that's coming in right out of the colleges, and, and some of our best talent keeps leaving the state, and so it's always interesting to me to understand why that keeps happening and what would cause people to stay. And the only hypothesis I have is that if they get engaged in the community here, they're more likely to stay. So when I go back to my buddies, Chris and Ben, so Chris is now at the Skillman Foundation. And so foundations are those that provide capital so that not-for-profits can do their work. He's a, he's a, he has a new role that's kind of carved out for him. He's the director of change making. So all this community-related work that he's very fulfilled by and motivated from has led him to incredible career success to have this new role with this organization. Ben Smith is still at Plant Moran. He's on the track to make partner there. And I'm at Deloitte, and I'm hopefully on the track to make partner as well. Right, so there's a correlation between all of this stuff that we do in community and then personal success. So there, it definitely ties. And it definitely keeps us here. None of us have left the region, nor do we plan to. We feel pretty connected to the work here, and so I don't have plans to relocate anytime soon. So that's kind of all the remarks I had to say. Any, any last questions to wrap up? I, I think that one of the points that you made about um, you don't know where to start, just get out there and do it. And, and when you explained your project at Gleaners, how that was probably your legacy project in your 2001 class. Yes. OK, well, I'm, so I'm really excited to hear that you went further. So you were obviously inspired by that project. And I think that's what you'll find when you start doing some nonprofit work or volunteering, um, whatever it is that your niche is, you'll you'll get passionate and you know, who knows, maybe you'll be staying as a parent yeah. a few years and old heads alone. And I had a question for just about United Way in general. Um, okay, there is so much need out there. How do you guys decide, you know, who gets what? It's gotta be very difficult. You know, we used to try to just say yes to everything and make everyone happy, but we realized we weren't getting anything. And so in 2005, we identified our critical areas, which are disability education, access to basic needs, and really see those as the root cause of a lot of other problems. So, for example, um, in our homeless outreach work, in, you know, what, 
seven years ago, we just would have asked the question of how many more beds did the homeless shelter need this year versus last year? Can we fund those? Okay, we can, we can, so we're successful. Now we look at it and say, okay, we'll give you the money for the beds, but why is homelessness growing? And what can we do to get the people who are willing and capable of getting off the streets and into something more um, stable? What can we do to help them and what barriers are they facing? And if we can tackle those and move people from one point to another, then that's how we make success. And so it's really shifted um, you know, our perspective on things really us have to focus, but the hardest part of it is not always easy because there's people who are emotionally tied to different well, things. Sure. Yeah. And especially with the economy in the way that we've had to make some really difficult decisions. Um, Joe mentioned the uh, reading at grade level and the impact that it has on what prisons they built. Um, we had a three-pronged education approach, um, one of which was any of the kids not reading at grade level, we were committed to getting up to grade level. Um, but we realized just the way you know our things on the economy, we could not turn the high schools around, get kids ready for kindergarten, and focus on the grade school reading. And there was enough other folks in that space that we felt we could step out of it and still be taken care of. But those are some of the hard decisions we've had. One of the things that's interesting, right, which compels me, so on this walk of trying to figure out what do we do in education or entrepreneurism, it was either like, do we need to create something ourselves or is there enough good work to be supportive of? The only way's work is worth supporting. One of the things I really like about it is their approach isn't to try to kind of match dollar for dollar uh, cash to problem. Their efforts are a strategy to build capacity that then scales outward without capital. So they're really building knowledge in the communities around you know, how do I teach my kids to read? How, what, what resources does a parent need to do that? And then how can um, a parent in a neighborhood that learns this new skill to be supportive of their child teach those around them that same skill? And certainly we'll pay for the resources and books, but we don't have to go one-to-one -to, -one to everybody. We're looking for some sort of organic growth. And I think those kinds of really smart strategies and the people behind them are really worth getting behind, which is why for me, the Idaho Way is the charity that I spend a lot of time supporting because they're just not doling out cash, they're actually solving real root cause problems. So it makes a lot of sense. So it's a huge amplifier to the effort in the capital. It was really interesting. It's sometimes interesting to ask that question that I asked earlier. What, what do you know about United Way? What is the you know, preconceived notion you have? Or you know, we have a highly recognized brand. People have heard of it, but, you know, but the problem we sometimes run into is that there's misconceptions about what we do because there's a whole uh, history that goes along with the United Way and what that's historically meant versus what it means now. Um, so to have fresh ears to uh, describe what the work to is always great for us, but it also helps sometimes to even just mention that we're in the process of transition and change always. We, at least right now, because we are working towards moving from uh, activity, measuring our activity, um, buying beds, you know, uh, buying food, that kind of thing, giving it to the community, donating X amount of dollars to nonprofit agencies to do certain things, um, moving from that model to actually measuring the impact that we're making and measuring our success in that way that Rick is describing. Um, so, recognizing that transition and uh, as an organization it, it's interesting for me to reflect on how uniquely we are positioned as a nonprofit because we are a nonprofit we're competing with corporate groups municipalities um, you know Detroit public schools we're interacting with players that um, not every organization is uh, positioned to be able to interact with so that uh, you know the thing that I feel United Way does best is partnerships and collaborating with convening partners that are going to create the most impact and the correct solution and getting the right players at the table to do that. Um, and uh, engaging, you know, not just the, the hands of volunteers, but the minds of the volunteers and using the skills because that, that's real impact, you know. Um, cleaners who needs people to pack food boxes and uh, sort through food and distribute that. That's a need that's in the community. Um, and it's being fulfilled by cleaners if we partner with them to um, 
but I'll, this is my like shameless plug because I my job is to create opportunities for college students in our work. Um, so if you are one of those students who wants to get involved or uh, find what your area of passion is, I'm your girl. You can talk to me. We can you know talk about you know what interests you, what your skills are, and find an opportunity that's right for you. Um, whether it's in United Way or otherwise, um, I'm always going to try to connect you back to our work and um, I can be a resource um, for connecting you to an area um, of your passion as well. So. That gives me an idea. So you asked Brittany, how do you get in the front door? Just one interesting thing, and I want to go in this cleaner's example. Um, one of the most effective things you can do for a not-for-profit is accurately talk about their mission to other people and not distort it and not cast stereotypes. Let me give you an example. Have you seen at Gleaners that market that they have on site? It's kind of like, an, like a super, it looks like a supermarket. If you didn't know what it was, you'd think it's just a store. No, I don't think okay. Next time you go, look for it. So, most of you would know that Gleaners distributes food to homeless people, right? And that's kind of their mission. You'd say that's their mission. Let me spin it for you. On site, they have a market. It looks like any other supermarket. It looks like a store. It's stocked with food. When people go into it that are homeless, they walk through it like a store with a shopping cart, and they pull the food into their basket. No big deal, right? Huge deal. What does that do? It preserves their integrity as a human being. It builds them as a person. And that is a really different way to capture the mission of gleaners by talking about it like that. It actually touches lives in a different way than just distributing food, which kind of sounds like a big process. This is different. So if you walk around and talk about cleaners that way after you see it and experience it, people resonate with that mission. That's the same thing I do with the United Way to talk about them not as a big piggy bank that distributes money. It's not what they do. They have really smart people that have strategies to fix problems in the community. That's a heck of a lot more compelling than a big piggy bank. And the big piggy bank isn't real, by the way. That's not what they do anymore. That was a long time ago. So again, just capturing the mission in a really meaningful way to other people, that is powerful right there. And that's something you could do right now with any cause you care about. So with that, I think I'll stop because I think we've kind of covered a lot of ground. I do thank you for being here um, and for your engagement in this. So thank you. Well, I want to thank you, Joe, and thank you three for coming. I'm very impressed with what you do. And Emily, if you're okay with this, I have their contact information. I can email them yours. And she'll offer it up for them to contact you so then they can, they can take the initiative. All right. Thank you so much.